17th anniversary, and it's a nice round number, the 35th anniversary of the Society. Uh, we've got a great uh, meeting for you tonight, uh, coming to us long distance from Indiana, and Sally Carter is going to tell us all about Indiana at the World's Fair. Uh, we were chatting a little bit. I sure hope everyone has stayed as safe as they can and stayed healthy, and uh, glad no one's gotten, uh, let's say, really sick or hospitalized or anything like that. So, uh, you know, vaccinations are becoming a little bit more available. I was managed to get mine over here in Illinois, and uh, I think even Missouri is starting to, you know, get more and more people done one or two shots. Uh, anybody uh, had one or two shots? Hold your fingers up, one or two. Oh, I see a lot of, uh, you know, fingers and stuff going up there. So, uh, you know, that's all good that, uh, you know, things are starting to happen, at least for uh, us over 50 people. <laughs> okay, uh, for any visitors that are here, do we have any visitors that you can uh, either push the wave your hand or raise your hand button or wave at us or anything? Any visitors? Well, if there are, I want to welcome you all to the uh, 1904 World's Fair Society monthly meeting. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization that started in 1986, and we promote the memory and memorabilia of the fair. And we have a website. It has a membership form on it. And uh, if I can recruit you, I'd love to recruit you and tell you all about the meeting. So feel free to contact myself. Uh, my email address is at the uh, contact list of the uh, meeting that you are now attending. Hi, Georgia and Jeff. I saw you just come on, George Holling. I'll mute myself. I'll be good. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Shara. Um, a few announcements. Uh, right now, everyone should be muted. Uh, it's one thing to have a pet uh, photobomb you, and that's certainly acceptable or whatever. But uh, try to hold down the conversation and stuff is why we've got uh, people muted. Uh, on the other hand, as a presenter last month, I found out there's a negative to that. Uh, if you tell a joke, you can't hear anybody chuckle or laugh. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it's uh, the Zoom world we're in. Also, uh, during the presentation, if you have any questions, if you turn on your chat window, which goes to the right of your main window, and the chat button is at the bottom of your screen when you move the arrow down below all the pictures, uh, you get a pane over there that shows the participants. Uh, if you click on participants, and there's also a chat. And chat will bring up uh, a little thing that says to everyone in the waiting or to everyone uh, at the meeting. And you can type your questions in there. And David will be uh, gathering any questions uh, that come up for Sally and ask them uh, at the end of her presentation. And uh, after the questions are asked and uh, addressed, we'll open up the microphones for any verbal questions. And I'm sure things will degenerate sometime after that. And we'll give you all another 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, I want to remind everyone to visit the Society website, our Facebook group, and our Instagram pages. How many people have been to the Society's Instagram pages? Raise your hand and wave. Not too many people. Uh, it's got a lot of followers. Uh, Holly, are you on board with us uh, right now? Uh, I'm not seeing you, I don't think, in the list, but I haven't uh, um, looked all the way down the list lately. There you are here. She is on. Holly Childress worked at, works at the Art Museum, and she scours the web and goes to some of the really unusual places and finds out a, an unusual picture and puts it on Instagram. And you can look at the picture. There's a nice description of it. And you can uh, give it a thumbs up that you like it. Uh, and uh, you know, just let her know that uh, you're interested to see th unusual pictures. Of course, our Facebook page has a lot of pictures of memorabilia being posted uh, and pictures of the fair. And we get into some good, really good discussions and uh, you know, knowledge of people, et cetera. Um, Craig Schmidt is having fun with his uh, background and stuff, trying to do a virtual background with the uh, thing, and he keeps moving around and it kind of is flashing. Virtual background works really good sometimes and not so good other times, I think. Uh, and also on our website, uh, we're going to get uh, the information about our upcoming meetings, and I'll tell you about those at the end on the website. Uh, 
Uh, I hope all the society members have uh, received their March bulletin that Jana Meehan puts out. Uh, Jana, I bet you're online here too. Uh, hope you're uh, feeling better after your surgery and uh, you know things are moving along for you. Um, let's see. Uh, and I also hope that uh, all of our members uh, last year, 20, you know, if you remember before 2020 or in 2020, you should have received a gift from the society, a little mailing tube with a uh, uh, overview of the fair on it. And hopefully that's good. And uh, I've really enjoyed, uh, that's what's uh, behind me right now in my virtual background. Uh, renewals for 2021 went pretty well. There were about 40 or so members who did not renew. I'm gonna give them one last reminder. They've already received their last <laughs> issue in February. Uh, the March issue has gone out and they uh, didn't get it yet. So next I'd like to uh, set the stage for tonight and tell everyone a little bit about the World's Fair history from 117 years ago. On February 18th, 1904, it was also a Thursday. Uh, it was about six weeks until the fair opened and a lot of work remained to be done, uh, as you'll find out. Meanwhile, there was a song that everyone in St. Louis was uh, singing that come out on sheet music a couple months ago and Meet Me in St. Louis was uh, just a fun song to sing. I don't think they were singing the trolley song though, Ben. Um, so back in the newspapers uh, on February 18th, I'm sorry, I said February, on March 18th, President Francis issued an order that no new buildings were to be started after April 1st. He also declared that all construction must be finished by April 29th. Uh, I don't think they quite made it, especially on the pike. The director of works, Isaac Taylor, authorized contractors to quadruple their workforce if necessary to get everything done in time. Uh, those people who had been residing in major downtown St. Louis hotels for long periods of time received bad news. Even those who had boarded regularly for years at some of those hotels were notified on May 1st that their rates would significantly be increased and would stay in effect through the end of the World's Fair. Gee, that wouldn't be called price gouging, would it? Okay, uh, a new order went into effect on the fairgrounds banning the taking of packages from the fairgrounds. The order was partly in response to uh, the fact that the Chinese exhibit had been closed while they were constructing it because dozens of items and carved fixtures had been disappearing. Uh, apparently two Chinese workers though were somewhat surprised because they were stopped on their way out removing a lavishly decorated frog. And a newspaper article also reported that women would be represented in the aeronautical competition. Mrs. Charlotta Myers of Utica, New York said she planned to compete for the $5,000 prize offered for a balloon flight from St. Louis to Washington, DC. Uh, she was the wife of Professor Carl Myers, the superintendent of the World's Fair Aeronautics Department. Well, the balloon flights that were attempted didn't travel very far, um, you know, a matter of 10, maybe 15 miles or something like that. They just didn't have enough, uh, you know, hydrogen to stay up or, you know, they hadn't come up with the hot air burners and stuff yet. So uh, that was one of those prizes that went unclaimed. I'd like to remind attendees that if you do have any questions for the presenter during the presentation, please enter them into the Zoom chat panel. David will catch those. Uh, you activate it by mouse, putting your mouse on the bottom button that says chat and just type it in there. Um, uh, Linda Koenig says, thanks, that won't do it. It says my camera needs to be turned on. Uh, how do I do that? Well, that's kind of a setup question. If you, uh, on the video button at the bottom, there's a little arrow next to it, Linda. If you click on that little arrow, it should show probably for your computer, uh, if, if you're on a computer, the integrated webcam that's there. Uh, if you're on your phone, uh, it should be working automatically to use your phone camera. So 
Hope you can uh, get that worked out. Okay, right, uh, right by the, uh, right by the microphone, the little arrow. Well, not the microphone. That's for the audio. Okay. The little camera is the video. All right. I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. Um, I've never ha had this happen before. Hmm. Okay. Lin Linda, this thanks. Is this is Diane. Um, hi, Diane. Hi. How you doing? Do okay. You have do you have like a little, what do they call it, shutter where you move a little um, lever back and forth at the top of your PC if you're, if you're on a laptop? I'm on a laptop. Okay, at the top, is there like a little uh, slide bar that opens and closes a little door over your camera? Because that uh, was a problem I had one time. It was an easy fix. Huh. Okay, I see that little shutter. It's about halfway across. Yeah, is there a little slide bar? Because see, I, I put mine closed, now I open it. Ah, old mechanical style yeah. of uh, like okay. a piece of tape. Okay, yeah. Th thank you all. I'm not okay. gonna hold anybody up anymore, please. <clears throat> okay, Thanks. thank you, Linda. Thanks. Okay, uh, well, I want to introduce uh, our presenter tonight, Sally Carter. Sally volunteers at the Han Museum of Indiana Art in Lafayette, Indiana, which is less than a mile from her house. The museum is located in the Connecticut building from the 1904 World's Fair. The Connecticut building was relocated after the fair to Lafayette, uh, went through an owner or two, and eventually ended up being purchased by the Hans, who turned it into the uh, Museum of Indiana Art. Besides exhibits of Indiana art, the museum has hosted a few World's Fair days over the last several years to celebrate their connection to the St. Louis World's Fair. Uh, and Sally has, uh, along with uh, the owners uh, and managers, really gotten into the World's Fair from those World's Fair days, I think. Uh, they've been very popular and well attended. We've reported on them in the bulletin. And at this point, I'm going to turn control over to Sally. Uh, you're not muted, and I'm sharing my screen over to you right now. Okie dokie. Well, I am going to bring up my PowerPoint and get it full screen. Come on. Okay. Am I full screen? And can everybody hear me? I hear you fine and see okay. full screen. Okay. Great. Um, I'm just going to repeat some of what um, Mike said, um, but I will start out with I am here as somebody who is interested in Indiana's participation at the St. Louis World's Fair. I'm not actually here representing the museum. It's a, mu it's a minor point, but I'll mention it. Um, I work in the business system at Purdue University, working directly with students who are working on their senior capstone projects. And because of where I work and what I do, I'm aware of other senior capstone projects in the college. And so you're gonna see um, a very short clip of one of the projects that the kids did um, a couple years ago for us. And they got more, they've done several and they've got more to do for us too. I hope you will find interesting the many ways in which Hoosiers, cause that's what we're called, people from Indiana are not Indianaans, we're Hoosiers. Um, how we were involved with the fair and how we have left an imprint, a little imprint on you in St. Louis and how well we did overall. I am an act active member, whoops, I gotta remember to share my, move my thingy. I am an active volunteer at the Hahn Museum. Um, as Mike already said, the Hahn Museum was the um, Connecticut building at the fair. And in 2019, when we celebrated the 115th anniversary of the fair, I did the didactics for Indiana's participation in the fair and I became interested and proud in what I found out about Indiana's participation. When I do tours, um, I, don't, I don't use the same spiel every time, but I usually say I think of the house as having four lives. The Connecticut building at the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair. Potter was the name of the family that bought the house originally. Um, William Potter bought it. He lived there, then his son George lived there. Between the two generations, they were in the house for 80 years. Then in 1984, Bob and Ellie Hahn bought the house from the estate. They raised three boys in the house. Then they start, when the boys started moving out, they started collecting Indiana art. They had um, 
within two to four years, they had such a fine collection that other entities were um, borrowing art from them. The house now houses the finest collection of Hoosier art anywhere. In 2015, the house was turned over to the music was was turned over to the museum. So here you are. Here's the house, the Connecticut building at the Louis World's Fair. It was on Colonial Avenue, and it happens to be that Indiana's building was right across the street. Here's the house now. Here's a comparison. It's pretty obvious that it's the same house. And Diane, in your book, you've um, you've listed it as being about the only one that you can tell immediately um, that what it was. This is the house that was the inspiration for it. This was the Sigourney Mansion in Hartford, Connecticut that was built in 1820. Now, um, again, all right, again, here's a comparison. You can tell that you can see the similarities between the two houses, but this next screen is just a curiosity. Here's the front elevation of the house. Look at where the front door is. I think that's, whoops, I'm sorry. I think that's totally weird that that's where the front door is. Hmm. Yeah. So how did the house get to Lafayette? Well, here we are. This is the, um, I call it the other map. I, I don't know what you call it, but here's the Connecticut building. Here's the Indiana building. And looky, there's a rail line over here, relatively close. Well, guess what? That rail line is the Wabash Railroad. I cannot tell you how many times I heard Ellie Hahn say, the house was taken apart, loaded up onto the Wabash Railroad and brought to downtown Lafayette. It wasn't until I found this advertisement in the original World's Fair bulletins that it dawned on me, this is our Wabash. So um, the house was dismantled, piece by piece, labeled, loaded up onto a train and brought to downtown Lafayette. Now, these are the tracks that the train traveled on. We had two sets of tracks in town. This set ran through um, 14th Street, went 14 blocks down the middle of a main street. This was the Monon Railroad Station. It is now our Civic Theater house. Further down the street was another hotel um, that the train would make frequent stops at. This was mostly a passenger line though. Um, I'm sure the only reason the house came in on this line was because it was close to the fair. In May, on May 1st, 1865, a little bit south of town on this track, Abraham Lincoln's train stopped on the tracks on the way to Springfield with his um, body to be buried. Um, a couple of years ago, students put together this plaque that now stands in front of the Civic Theater honoring Lincoln for having stopped on his way to his inauguration and giving a short speech and then for having the train stopping for his um, um, funeral. The other set of tracks, and I'm, si I'm, I, I'm giving you all kinds of history here, folks, all kinds of side stuff here. The other set of tracks was a double set of tracks that ran diagonally through town. It happens to be that my house is on the property that those double set of tracks ran through. About 25 years ago, the city moved both sets of tracks parallel to the river. That would be the Wabash River. I cross it every day, coming and going to work. Our neighborhood has collectively gathered railroad spikes, pieces of iron, pieces of tile, drainage tile along the way as we've developed our land. Now, here we go. Here is a um, image from the video you're about ready to see. This project was done in spring of 2018 by computer graphics technology students. So here we go. I have to get out of here, do this, do this. Oh, wait, I forgot to do something. Sorry. Stop share. Shoot. Share screen. Here we go. Share sound. I learned to share sound early on. This is very short. Ah, I lost it. Sorry. Stop share. New share. Hmm. I hate it when this happens. 
I lost my video. Hold on, I got to get it again. Sally, we could see the picture okay. the first time you tried it. Well, I want the video. Oh. And so now it's up again. This frustrates me because this happens to me a lot and I just don't know. See, now I've lost you. Now we're seeing you fine. Uh, well, I discovered last time. Here we go. Have, Wait. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I discovered last meeting that if you have an application that wants to bring up a different window, you have to go to that share screen button at the or bar at the top and pick which window you want to share. Well, I had lost the window and now I've lost you. I can't see you. I can okay. hear you. I don't. Okay. I hate this. I just reshared to you. Okay. Dang it. All right, do you see a black screen that looks like a YouTube spot? No. Nope. Okay. I don't. Okay. All right. David, Diane, do you see anything? I see her Zoom uh, starting screen. I think see, actually, I, just, it's I can't see you Mike's at all. Screen. And Mike, we're actually, it, mine says we're viewing your screen. So we're not okay. seeing Sally. I, I'm, I'm going to close that Zoom screen. I'm going to have to. I got to go out and come back in. No, it. Uh, you'll find the other screen to be directly behind it. I can't, I can't see it. I can't see anything. I'm going to come back in. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to try stopping the share and do another share to Well, Mike, I thought you and I were the only ones on the line. Yeah, David, are you moving or are you just frozen? I'm just not moving. Okay. I'm, I, I just let Sally back in. It's funny. Okay. All right. I mean, I, if I can find the video, I'm going to play it. Otherwise, I'm, I'm going to give up. Oh, don't okay. give up. Okay. I'm sharing it to you, Sally. Okay. Um, I've got the message host disabled participant screen sharing. Yeah, I think, Mike, all we have is your screen again. Okay. Um, and it says one participant can share at a time. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it says who can share only host. Do you want me to change that to all participants so Sally can do it? Well, Sally's a co-host. She should be able to. Well, I'm going to try it again. You all. Oh, she lost her co-host privileges. Oh, when she came back in. <laughs> okay. And then I lost you again. Okay, I see your email, it looks like. So, no, yeah. is that my? I don't want it up. I have a cat that came out of nowhere. I don't know what I'm going to do with her. Okay, now I see your wallpaper. I see your desktop, Sally, with uh, four cats. Okay, there, okay, at least I got that back. All right. I see your PowerPoint. So, but I don't see my video. So I got to do find my video. See, this is what makes me crazy.
That's because I lost my video. That's why. All right. It was up. We see your camera, but that's it. Well, bear with me. I'm looking up for my video again. Okay. Something, some, something is happening that when I come on here, I'm losing my other thingy. So here we go. One more time. Here we go. Yay. Whoops, I got to back out. I didn't do the sound. Come on, get out of my way. Okay, I see your YouTube briefly there. Yeah, I got to get back my share. I forgot to share sound. There we go. Here we go. Desire to commemorate the one This is Ellie Hall in the background. Louisiana Purchase, which was just five Whoa. years away. They decided to hold an exposition in 1904, which became known as the St. Louis World's Fair. This is a map we have up in the uh, Great Hall. The state of Connecticut formed a commission to plan a Connecticut building as a state headquarters for exhibits and social functions. Architect Edward Hapgood designed the mansion after the 1820 Sigourney Mansion, a prominent home in Hartford. It was designed to represent a gentleman's country home. All exhibits and facades had to be removed from the grounds within three months of the fair's close. So the Connecticut building was designed and built to be auctioned off at the end of the fair. Many parts of the house, including the main doorway, interior columns, door capitals, and wainscoting were taken from the 1760 Hubbard Slater Mansion of Norwich, Connecticut. The H. Wales Lines Company built the mansion on site. The Connecticut building was the first of the state pavilions to be finished. The 10,900 square foot building was so attractive that many people approached Hapgood for his address. That William Potter, a well-to-do lawyer and capitalist from Lafayette, bought the building from Mr. Hall for $3,100 as a gift for his wife. The dismantling began within an hour of the fair's close. The building was taken apart piece by piece. To save money on cargo rates, parts were sorted by material before they were loaded onto rail cars. There were rail cars of doors, sashes, casings, bases, tapestries, bathroom fixtures, rough lumber, joists, partitions, and more. The first loop of the intramural railway went along the perimeter of Forest Park and served the state buildings. Fortunately, the railway was not far from the site of the Connecticut building. The building parts were shipped by the Wabash Railroad to Lafayette, Indiana, and then taken from the station to Potter's plot of land by horse and wagon. Potter hired Wing and Mahurin, an architectural firm based in Fort Wayne, to design the mansion with minor here we changes turned it into to the accommodate brick front. family living. Brick facade. When the building was rebuilt in Lafayette, the Potters added a kitchen and breakfast room. The first level of the veranda was shortened to make space for the kitchen wing. The second floor veranda remained above the new kitchen. For about 10 years. A side porch and a port crochet were added, and a balcony was extended over the driveway. Bob and Ellie Hahn bought the house from the Potter Estate in 1984. They began collecting historic Indiana art in 1992, and now have the finest and most complete collection ever assembled. The drawing room was used for formal functions at the World's Fair, and remains the most formal room in the house. Some highlights of the drawing room are a 10-foot Renaissance Revival pier mirror, an 1872 Chickering Concert Grand Piano with a rare art case, a 7-foot Weller Aurelian vase that won a gold medal for the arts at the 1904 World's Fair, and an orchestral cylinder music box with five instruments. It has 12 interchangeable cylinders and each plays six tunes. So anyway, that gives you Come a little bit of an idea of how the house was taken apart and brought here. Only partially. I still would love to know the, the logistics of wrapping and labeling each piece, but they did it. So here we go again. 
Come on. Okay, now on to Indiana at the fair. As near as I can tell, all or most of the states produced a state report. And this, most of my, well, a lot of my information came out of our state report. Some of it came from at the fair and then other um, sources that I found. Important dates for us. May 19th was the day our building opened. On June 30th, we had dedication day, which you'll hear more about that in just a minute. September 1st was Indiana Day, and these medallions, it's the front and the back of the medallion that was um, issued as a commemorative for the day. November 27th, our building closed, and on the 30th, we had an auction. Of the approximately 20 million people who attended the fair, about 10% of them visited the Indiana building. The Indiana building had more guests than any other state building, the count being approximately 2.1 million. Missouri, as the host state, had the most visitors from their populace, and Indiana came in second as having the most guests from their populace. Even then, we were known for our Hoosier hospitality. Again, we were on Colonial Avenue um, facing the Connecticut building. Um, the Connecticut people wanted to represent a country gentleman's home. We, a gentleman's country home, we wanted to represent a country club. And we did a pretty fine job of it. Now, you heard Ellie mention the name Wing and Mahern um, on the video. Wing and Mahern came out of Fort Wayne, Indiana. They designed the Indiana building. Guy Mahern was the nephew of Marshall Mahern, and Guy is the one who designed the Philippine Village for the St. Louis World's Fair. He was living in the Philippines. He was designing a building in Manila and they thought he was just the perfect candidate to do the job. Then Mahurans are the ones that turned the Connecticut building into a private residence um, of the Connecticut, turned the Connecticut building into a private residence. Now the other main name that comes up and is through the fair several times is Caldwell and Drake. Caldwell and Drake came out of Columbus, Indiana and they built the Indiana building. They not only built the Indiana building, they built the Palace of Agriculture, the Palace of Horticulture, the New York State Building, and over 18 other buildings at the fair. Now this one is another one of my asides. In 1901, they built the West Baden Springs Hotel here in Southern Indiana. Now before I go on, I do wanna mention Columbus a little bit more a minute. Columbus is well known a, in a large populace of people, for people who are interested in modernist art, architecture, um, Columbus, Indiana is well known. Um, there is at least one building by I.M. Pei. There is at least one building by each of the Serenins. I can never get that one quite right. And of course, it was Arrow that designed your St. Louis Arch. So next screen is West Baden Springs. Now, the building has a 200 foot dome on it. It was built in 1901. From 1902 to 1913, it was the largest dome in the world. Now, my rhetorical question is, this was built in 1901. Festival Hall had a 200 foot dome on it also. I'm curious as can be as to whether Caldwell and Drake consulted on that dome. I, I, I don't know how, I, you'd have to stumble across that information, but I think it's curious that they were both the same size. Um, this area was supposedly discovered by George Rogers Clark in 1778, and um, it has springs, natural springs, and salt licks, and tomato juice was created there in 1917. Now, we're going to the interior of the building. This is the grand staircase. And this is the music room. I'm assuming it's to your left, but I can't tell for sure. Now, this picture right here, not that any of us can really tell, is a picture that Bob and Ellie Hahn can recognize called Cliff Road by a man by the name of Williams Forsyth. This is one of three pictures that the, that the museum houses that actually hung in the Indiana building at the St. Louis World's Fair. Also, on June 3rd, when we had our dedication day, Alice Roosevelt was at the fair, and she came to our building for a reception. At the conclusion of the program, Ms. Alice Roosevelt visited the building and held an informal reception in the music room. So this is the music room. That picture that we have at the museum graced the same room that Alice Roosevelt did. 
This is an interior view. I'm assuming it's the other side of the staircase. Governor's reception room, reading room. And then I'm switching to a list of our commissioners. Now I'm not gonna talk about it, all of them. I'm only gonna talk about the two that are colored differently. Henry Marshall was the vice president of our commissioners and he lived here in Lafayette. And Frank C. Ball was chairman of our building committee and he lived in Muncie. Now, for those of you that do canning and use ball canning jars, this is the ball of ball canning jars. Frank was one of five brothers. They lived, they originally came from out east. Indiana has a lot of natural gas and we, are, we had a, a fairly decent history of, of glass making because of it. So again, if you're a tanner and you use ball glass, this is the family it came from. Ball State University is also named after him, after the family, and you're gonna hear a little bit more about Ball State here in just a minute. Um, our commissioners were extremely responsible with their money. They only, only had $150,000 to spend and they turned $15,000 of it back to the state at the end of the fair. Um, when we auctioned, when we closed the building and auctioned stuff off, the house, the, 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 with the house as a whole was sold as scrap and um, it brought a little bit more money than expected. And then the objects that weren't, that didn't belong to somebody else were auctioned off individually. And that also brought a little bit more than expected. Now, William or Henry Marshall lived in this house in 1904. This house is three houses from the Connecticut building. What was the Connecticut building? The Han, what we call the Potter Hahn mansion. Um, so that means this man got to watch this house being built. He got to see the hole being dug for the basement because there's a full basement in the house um, here in Lafayette. And if you're interested in moving to Lafayette and would like to buy this house, it's on the market for $1.2 million. How about that? We had hostesses. I think all states had hostesses, or at least several of them did. I've seen references to it. We had two hostesses on duty every day, and they served about 10 days each. For the most part, they were wives of the commissioners, plus a daughter or a friend of some kind. Then this is a list of the artwork that was in the Indiana building. Indiana's most famous artist is Theodore Clement Steele, T.C. Steele. He's considered the father of what is called the Hoosier Group. There's five men in the Hoosier Group. There's T.C. Steele, there's Otis Adams, there's William Forsyth, there's Richard Gruel, and there's Otto Stark. So all four of those five men had pictures in the building. I don't know why Steele didn't have one of his, it doesn't matter. Um, then there's a man by the name of um, John Bundy, who was from a different group of artists. Those six men were responsible for pulling together all of this artwork that was in the building. Now, as a, another one of my asides, Richard Gruel, it was his sons, Johnny and Justin, that wrote and illustrated the Raggedy Ann and Andy series. Um, James Whitcomb Riley was from Indiana. And two of James Whitcomb Riley's poems were the inspiration for Raggedy Ann and Andy. Um, the Raggedy Man and Little Orphant Annie were the two poems or books. And somehow from that, the boys got Orphan Annie. Um, here in this list, we, I already mentioned Cliff Road from William Forsyth, but we have one called the Floodgate by, um, here, the old Floodgate. That picture was in the museum. And John Bundy, who is over here, one of the men that decorated the building, uh, Gray, Aut um, Gray Autumn Morning is also in the museum. Now, on to the palaces. Palace of Agriculture. Again, the Palace of Agriculture was built by Caldwell and Drake from Columbus, Indiana. Indiana had two booths in the Palace of Agriculture. This one was corn only. Um, from our state, this quote came from, so it's a little biased. 
Um, Indiana surpassed all other states in this exhibit, having the most attractive presentation as well as the finest display of superior corn. The corn exhibit won four grand prizes. This booth was more general. And of all things, I, I, I forget this from time to time until I'm going through the report again. It included a tobacco exhibit, which earned a silver medal. I certainly don't think of Indiana as being a tobacco growing state. Now, there, there, are, there were um, people from the uh, Louisiana Purchase Exposition Commission who, who gave kudos, left kudos for us for different departments. This was one of them. It was from F.W. Taylor, who was the chief of the Department of Agriculture. The, the general agricultural display is orderly, well-grouped, and artistically installed and must reflect credit on the state and praise to the commission. Then in another paragraph, the work of your state in presenting corn is most excellent. It is also imposing and pleasing in its physical aspects. So I have all kinds of reasons for being proud for what we did. Now, still in the pa Palace of Agriculture, the Pure Food Act was passed in 1906. But in 1904, it was already well in motion. Sarah Tyson Rohrer, who, re who ran the um, East Cas Cascade restaurant, was on board for the Pure Food Act. And in the 20-acre ag building was a two-acre exhibit of adulterated food. Now, our grandparents, or great-grandparents, depending on how old you are, ate garbage. Um, Harvey Washington Wiley, the man on the left here, was the head chemist at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He was their first chemist, and he was chemist at this point in time. It happens to be that Harvey Washington Wiley was not only born in Indiana, he was faculty at Purdue University before he left to go to Washington to be their chief chemist. He was a chemistry professor here. He also got a lot of trouble with the board of uh, trustees with Purdue University. They fired him once at least. They didn't like the fact he wore knickers. He did, they didn't like the fact that he rode a high wheel bicycle but they hired him back. But he finally left and went, um, went, went to DC um, as their um, chemist. Um, he was buried in, and he's buried in Arlington Cemetery, which I think is very, very interesting. Um, Palace of Education. I can't get through this in our state report. There are eight pages, single spaced, of all the kinds of dis, um, exhibits that were in the building. I mean, from kindergarten on through the higher education. Um, we do have a kudo from Howard J. Rogers, the chief of the Department of Ed Education. Um, Purdue University was in the section of polytechnic schools. The exhibit made by this institution was thorough and comprehensive and was so highly appreciated by the International Jury of Awards to receive a grand prize. Now it happens to be that Teddy Roosevelt was at the fair on November 20, I put 26, I don't think that's right, I think it was the 27th. No, 26 is right. And he was in our booth at the Indiana, at the education building. How do I know? Because he signed our guest book. This is, an, this is from the archives of the Purdue University libraries. Back when I was doing the didactics, I had contacted archives and said, how do I find out what you have about Purdue's and or Indiana's participation at the fair? And they came back with, we have three boxes and one of them has a guest book that Teddy Roosevelt signed. So I get to the library, I get to the book and sure enough, there's the signature. And, oh, I'm sorry, I, um, it's this one right here. I don't know how well it looks, shows up on your screen, but it's this one right here. Um, I said, how did you find this? How did you know this was here? And they had had guests through about two weeks before I made my inquiry. They, the, the archive people randomly picked out this box. They randomly picked up this book and a guest randomly flipped through it and happened to see the signature. So how is that for fate? I mean, if I'd have been two weeks earlier, three weeks earlier, I'd have never known it was there. But I think that's a pretty cool thing. Um, okay, Palace of Electricity. I don't have any pictures 
of our exhibit here. Um, but we did win four gold medals and six silver medals. And this palace is out of alphabetical sequence. Everything else is in alphabetical sequence, but there's a reason for it. This is our exhibit, one of our exhibits in the Palace of Mines and Metallurgy. Now, this is our oolitic stone exhibit. Now, if we were face to face, I would say, does anybody know what oolitic, another word for oolitic stone is? But since we're not face to face, I'll leave it as a rhetorical question and answer it for you that it is another word for limestone. Indiana is well known for its limestone. Um, largest building stone quarries in the world, continuous operation since 1830s. Uh, these quarries have produced stone for many of the world's largest and finest memorials, buildings, and bridges. We have stone, Indiana limestone, in the Empire State Building, the National Cathedral, the Pentagon. In fact, when the Pentagon was rebuilt after 9-11, more Indiana limestone went back into it. More than half of the state capitals have Indiana limestone in them. Yankee Stadium and Rockefeller Center are some of the other places that do. Now, my next rhetorical question is gonna to have to be, do you know why limestone, Indiana limestone is so important to the fair and to you? Well, the reason is the Palace of Fine Arts. Your, um, your art museum was made out of Indiana limestone. Um, from at the fair, he says the main structure was constructed out of Bedford limestone, the highest quality limestone in the United States. Um, staying with the Palace of Fine Arts, the museum has two pictures, two paintings that hung in the Palace of Fine Arts. One of them is by T.C. Steele, Theodore Clement Steele, the father of the Hoosier group. Um, that picture hangs all, out all the time. The other picture is called Wet February by a man by the name of Charles Connor. Unfortunately, it is out of rotation. They don't keep it out all the time, which is, which I wish they did. But anyway, so we have five pictures in the house that were at the fair. Okay, Palace of Forestry, same thing. I don't have anything about, um, I don't have any pictures of our exhibits, but we won a grand prize and a gold prize. The Palace of Horticulture, Sorry. The Palace of Horticulture, um, this is a quote from our, our state report. Notwithstanding the fact that 1903 and 1904 were both fruit years for Indi were poor fruit years for Indiana fruit growers, the Indiana exhibit ranked with the best and received more awards than that of any other state. And a man, a faculty member from Purdue University was responsible for part of that exhibit. Okay, back to the Palace of Liberal, back to the Palace, oh no, shoot. I'm getting internet connection unstable, I hope it keeps going. Okay, um, again, no pictures, but we won one gold medal, five silver medals. I'm sorry, I misspoke. I'm in the Palace of Liberal Arts. We got one gold medal, five silver medals, one bronze medal, and three grand prizes. Palace of Machinery, we got one gold medal, three silver medals, and four bronze medals. And then the Palace of Manufacturers. Hold on. At the Chicago World's Fair, there was a ladies' building. Um, for the St. Louis World's Fair, the, it was a conscious decision not to segregate the ladies. So the ladies from whatever state participated ended up either in the Palace of Manufacturers and or the Palace of Varied Industries. Um, for us, this was our exhibit. It was made out of mahogany and our ladies were um, textiles in this particular location. And textiles was in this lace making. Um, a kudo from Milan H. Holbert, Chief of Manufacturers. I wish to take this opportunity to congratulate um, your commission upon the attractive exhibit you have made in this department of the needlework and decorated China. Uh, I think you like, well, never mind. Uh, China uh, executed by the women of your state. Favorable comments upon both the exhibits have reached me many times since the opening of the exposition, and I cannot allow this exposition to come nearer to its close with advising you that I personally appreciate 
your successful efforts. And he's, he's grouping varied industries in China uh, in there together. Um, so now we're back to the Palace of Mines and Metallurgy. Um, the coal exhibit made by the state was the largest and most attractive coal exhibit in the Palace of Mines and Metallurgy. That's from our state report. Kudo from J.A. Holmes, Chief of Mines and Metallurgy. The Indiana exhibit of Building Stone here in the Mines, Mil Mines Building is the finest I have seen in any exposition, and your commission deserves great credit for the taste which, which, with which they have shown getting up and installing this exhibit. Your coal exhibit is also one of the biggest I've ever seen. And Palace of Transportation, this automobile was made by the Hayes Apperson Company in Kokomo, Indiana. And Haynes claims it was the first American automobile. It was on display in the transportation building. Then the last, whoops, the last palace was the Palace of Varied Industries. Again, um, women were in this building. This exhibit was white enamel and gold. Um, when we did our 115th anniversary of the St. Louis World's Fair, we had, um, Needle workers come in, I'm actually, um, or lace makers come in, I'm actually a lace, a sort of lace maker, and we had China painters come in. So we, we honored both, both sets of um, ladies at the, at the St. Louis World's Fair. Lastly, we did get praise from David Francis. It has been my pleasant privilege on more than one occasion, I believe, to refer in public utterances to the very credible showing which Indiana made at the fair. Of course, we expected a fine display from a state, state possessing the great natural resources and inhabited by a people of well-known culture and thrift of Indiana, and we were not disappointed. Um, we had 108 individual exhibitors. We had 77 awards and prizes. Um, I'm not gonna go into the detail from there. So we did get a lot of awards and recognition at the fair. So now I'm leaving the palaces and I'm going on to the Olympics. And again, because of our situation, I can't say, does anybody know who this is? I will simply say, this is Ray Yuri. He competed in the Olympics at the fair. He was born and raised here in Lafayette. And I need to find another set of notes here, just a second. Okay, he graduated from Purdue in engineering. He was born in Lafayette. He was orphaned. He was diagnosed with infantile paralysis at age seven. Doctors said he'd likely have to use a wheelchair, but they gave him jumping exercises that he did in his yard and um, to strengthen himself. He played football and ran track at Lafayette High School. Um, which is the, also the high school I graduated from, and then from Purdue. After moving to New York to work as an engineer, he joined the New York Athletic Club and trained for the Olympics in a series of field events no longer held, the standing broad jump, the standing high jump, and the standing triple jump. He won eight gold medals in those events, spread over three Olympic games, including the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair. Those 10 Olympic titles were an individual record until t um, 2004 when Mike Phelps came in with 23 um, gold medals and 28 medals overall in the Olympic run. He is, I actually never knew about him until the fair, but he has all kinds of honors here in town. Um, he's, there's a youth center um, that's named after him. There was a postage stamp issued for him. The Ray U. Ray Sports Engineering Center was opened was dedicated homecoming weekend in 2019. From homecoming 2018 to homecoming 2019, Purdue University um, celebrated 150th anniversary. And um, uh, in, we're, we're this, the state's land grant college. The charter day was actually in early May. Um, it happened, this is one of my asides, um, it happens to be that Purdue University has graduated more astronauts than anybody other than three of the military academies. We now have 24, 25 astronauts 
that have graduated from Purdue University, past, present, and future. Um, Purdue University's most famous graduate is Neil Armstrong. It happens to be that Neil Armstrong's 50th anniversary of the moonwalk happened during our 150th anniversary of the university. 150 years of giant leaps was what they used for the tagline for our celebration. Um, Weller Potter Company, they were the only active kiln at the fair. They were located up by the Plateau States um, in the Gulch, near the Gulch. I have to say that I have, up until recently, I have always preferred the Ferris map, but in the last few months, I've learned that what I call the other map, um, the, the other map, it's all I know to call it because it's a long other title. This building shows up on that map, but it doesn't show up on the Ferris map. There's a lot of buildings that show up on the other map that don't show up on the Ferris map. But this was a freestanding building. They had on display at the fair five vases, the largest of which was seven feet tall. They were, they were manufactured, they were fired in the late 1800s. The tallest one took a special kiln and eight firings before they were able to finish the vase without it collapsing. The Hahn Museum has the three largest vases. Of the other two, one's at the Ruth Muir Mansion in Elkhart. We don't know where the third one is. But here we've got just a list of some of the items we have from the fair. Um, we have some andirons that are in the drawing room. They would have probably come from the van manufacturer's building or the varied industries building. There's a candle table. This little candle table right here, Bob happened to find it online about three years ago. The picture you see, I snipped it out of Connecticut's report. That candle table was in the Connecticut building at the St. Louis World's Fair. The chandelier in the drawing room is original. Um, Hans have a, a nice general collection of memorabilia, memorabilia, memorabilia. Again, there's five paintings that we have. There's a telephone from the St. Louis World's Fair. And lastly, again, the largest three Weller vases. It happens to be that the hand you're seeing in that picture is David Letterman's hand. Here's a postcard of the um, vase from about the 40s. And here is a picture comparing the original postcard, they're a little skewed in, in proportion, sorry, uh, the original postcard and the recreation that David Letterman did on his show in May 10th, 1983, when he pronounced this the world's largest vase. Now, David Letterman is from Indiana. David Letterman went to Ball State University. Now, if you think that wasn't trivia, what I've produced so far, this is my true trivia time. Okay, Prince Pulun um, was at the fair from China. He traveled around the United States while he was here. One of the trips he made was to Indianapolis, and this is a picture from his visit to a Chinese restaurant there in Indianapolis. And believe it or not, while he was there, there was a motorcade that went from Indianapolis to Lafayette and back again. Everybody apparently had a good time. It took them four and a half hours, I think just one way, or no, four and a half hours, not including the problems they had with the cars. Madam Walker was not at the St. Louis World's Fair. The lady on the left, Annie Turnbow Malone, was at the St. Louis World's Fair. She was promoting, um, cosmetics um, care products for black ladies, and she mentored Madam Walker. Um, Madam Walker ended up in Indianapolis at some point in time and built her empire here. Madam Walker is the first woman in the United States to become a millionaire in her own right. She was not born into it. She was not married into it. She made her own money, and she was black on top of it. This theater on the right is a theater that is um, 
been rehabbed. It's I've not been in it. Uh, I've just seen pictures of it. It's gorgeous inside. But it was her building um, here in Indianapolis, and um, it ha it housed small businesses on the bottom. And again, this would be a rhetorical question or a question if we had um, we were in person. I don't know whether you can begin to recognize the lady on top of the plane, but it is Amelia Earhart. She was at the fair when she was seven years old. Oh, wait a minute. I need my other set of papers. Okay. Um, she was at the fair when she was seven years old. The two girls, that's her and her sister, uh, recalled the trip the family took to the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair. On their return from the fair, the seven-year-old Amelia designed and built a roller coaster in the yard with long planks propped up against the tool shed's roof. An uncle helped in the construction and the children saw it and hammered away with great enthusiasm until their mom stopped it. She thought it was uh, just a little bit too dangerous. Well, who would know that 30 some years later, Amelia Earhart would end up at Purdue University for good, bad, or indifferent. Um, for the last year and a half of her life, three semesters, she was under contract with Purdue University to be six weeks on campus for each of those three semesters. She was faculty, she was an advisor, she was a role model for women. She is the only woman on campus that was allowed to wear pants. The girls complained about it a little bit, and one of the one of the faculty said, when you fly solo across the ocean, you can wear pants too. So she's got pants on, all the other girls don't. Now, Purdue Research Foundation is a separate arm from Purdue University, but they provide us with a lot of funding. They granted Amelia the $80,000 that she bought her Lockheed Electra with. If she and Noonan and the plane had survived the trip, the plane would have been on the Purdue campus as a flying laboratory. Now it happens to be that the hangar she used, that airport, oh, and by the way, we were the first university to have an airport. That's, that's part of how she got here. That's part of what drew her here. Um, it happens to be that the um, School of Aviation Technology and Tran Transportation and Technology is under my college's wing, pun not necessarily intended, when I started working at the university 13 years ago, I went out to the airport for part of my training and I had to go to the bathroom and I said, they, you know, where's the bathroom? They told me where the bathroom was and their last words were, watch out for Amelia's ghost. So apparently the housekeeping people have trouble from time to time with Amelia's ghost. Purdue University Archives also houses the largest collection of Amelia Earhart memorabilia. Now, um, late sometime last year, Ellie Hahn put me on to a weekly newsletter that the state call, puts out called Hoosier History Highlights. And in October, this was one of the featured articles. The man who played the dad in the movie, Meet Me in St. Louis, was born and raised in Indiana. But in February, I found out that the lady who played the maid was born and raised in Indiana. And lastly, this happened last Saturday. Ellie Hahn has a couple of times mentioned that she heard a rumor that there was a bridge in Northern Indiana that was built out of scrap from the St. Louis World's, the Ferris wheel from the St. Louis World's Fair. Well, one of the docents came upon an article about the Dunn Bridge in Northern Indiana. The, the article does, however, um, debunk the story. This, this is the bridge in question, but it is not from scrap from the Chicago World's Fair. I'm not going into the logistics of why it isn't, um, but it's not. So, oh, so that is the end. I had fun pulling all this information together Two years ago, I had fun fine tuning it. I hope you found interesting stuff about Indiana, Lafayette, and our participation in the fair and our connections to St. Louis still. So I'm done with my PowerPoint. So that leaves you to questions.
Sally, I really enjoyed it, and I'm going to give you a round of applause by myself. Everyone else can wave oh, and well, you know, thank do a visual you. applause right there for a moment. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask David, uh, you know, were there any questions either you had or that uh, people have raised their hands on? Uh, no hands raised. I do see a question which you, you have kind of answered. The question was uh, from Holly about the source for the Palace of Fine Art being made from Indiana limestone. Um, yeah, it's, it was in, it's one of the articles in, one of the comments in At the Fair. Yeah, I uh, referenced, I thought I had read that it was Bedford limestone also, but uh, that's something that Holly uh, uh, wants to verify somewhere. I, I gave her either the Bennett book or Francis book to, uh, you know, take a look at. Um, Kathy Whipperman, I saw that uh, you had uh, uh, raised your hand with a question. Uh, you can unmute yourself by clicking on the mute button and ask away. Same for uh, Stephen Vital. No, I, instead of raising my hand, that was supposed to be a clap. Oh, thank you. Oh, no. I was clapping with my hand raised. We, we do have two more also that were posted. Uh, Diane would like to know if Purdue itself had a display at the fair. Um, we did, but I don't, I don't have the details right at my hand, but, um, but we did. And then uh, Candace would like to know, how did the Potters first see the house and decide to buy it? And do you know why they chose to buy it and transport it, which was a difficult and expensive task instead of building one just like it? Thank you for, thank you for asking that question because there is a little bit of a story behind it. They did go to the fair. Um, it happens to be that Mrs. Potter had Connecticut roots. Now she wasn't born in Connecticut. She was born in Pennsylvania, but she had family that went back to Connecticut and she fell in love with the building. Now, Connecticut actually built that building with the intention of selling it when the fair was over. So it just happened to be that the two things worked together. Connecticut wanted to sell the building and Potters wanted to buy the building. Now it happens to be that Potter didn't win the original bid. A man by the name of Robert Hall from Pennsylvania won the bid at the auction. He bought the house for $1,800. Fanny Potter was so disappointed, she apparently harped on William Potter long enough that he, he actually hooked up with Robert Hall, um, made arrangements to buy the house from him. And my, my phrase is, Paul made quite a haul off of this deal. He paid, again, $1,800. Potter paid him $3,125, and Hall didn't lift a finger. So that's the story. Can you all hear us? Yeah. Yes. Uh, can you see this? Yes, it's one of the mesas. We have it. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Which one is it, the smallest one or the second one up? We, we, I think it's the smallest. Cool. I will make note of that. And now we know where all five of them are. Cool. And the, 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 uh, the Ruth Mir and Elkhart, I think they have fairly recently acquired the one they had. We, uh, <clears throat> we bought it. Bob, Bob bought it at a sale. Uh, in Lone Jack, Missouri, and we had we had the papers on it, and it is in Jefferson City. And if anybody'd like to come and see it, they are welcome. Well, cool. Thank you. It's really pretty. Yeah, the um, the three we have are are really pretty. Um, the the one I love the seven foot one just because it's so huge, but the 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 third one down, the middle sized one, is kind of a lavender color, and it's real. They're all they're all pretty. What can I say? I'm sorry. This is, this is pink. I don't know if y'all can see that. No, you can't see the color. No. There's pink and blues and and. Mm -hmm. uh, how about how big is it? Good. I know. Twenty six inches. Okay. Thank you. Measure. That's oh, pretty no. good size. I'm sorry. 
it measures 25.5 inches. <laughs> I'll go with the 26. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, what other questions or well, comments? Uh, general interest question from, from Richard Smith about the background on Hoosiers and how the name came about. Yes. Well, <laughs> you know what? I didn't pull that piece of paper. Um, we don't know. Up until the time I did the didactics, I knew three or four different possible stories of how the name came about. But when I was doing the didactics, I delved in again to do we know yet how the name came about? And I heard a new one. And it's probably the most likely if, if even it is the story. But there was a man in Kentucky that liked to hire men from Indiana to do his construction work. I don't remember what it was, road work, canal work, whatever. And I don't know whether I got this out already or not. He liked to hire men from Indiana. The man's name was Hoosier, and the men became known as Hoosier's men. So whether they picked that up and took, took it through the whole state, I don't know. But we've been known as Hoosiers since at least like the first quarter of the 1800s. That's about when it showed up in print for the first time. Um, Sally, I've got something I'd like to share with everyone that, uh, you know, if you uh, are a collector, and I know Bob Herman out in Jefferson City undoubtedly has a lot of stuff he could put his hand on, but the reason I was popping up and down, I wanted to grab a couple things out that were made in that Weller Pottery Building Yay! at the World's Fair. Um, some of the pottery they made was kind of customized at the fair, and this is kind of a, a red red pinkish clay. Uh, they often had little symbols or little people drawn on one side. This one is kind of neat because it says Jerusalem, which was the Jerusalem exhibit at the World's Fair. And uh, I'm going to turn my uh, background off because it's making things kind of uh, blink in and out a little bit. Um, another thing that they made was uh, some little steins that come in different size and a little map of the Louisiana Purchase, red, white, and blue. And something they made a series of, um, they made these little ashtray size uh, things. And I think there's at least seven or eight of them that had profiles of various presidents from Washington and Lincoln to Roosevelt. I think there's a David R. Francis, a McKinley, not sure who else. And they're kind of unrecognizable, I kind of think. But the one that kind of uh, I found very interesting was this map that highlights the uh, Louisiana Purchase in 1803. And, you know, for you collectors or the Han Museum, whatever, they come up every once in a while in estate sales or whatever. Uh, these are all kind of rough, unglazed pieces, as opposed to like the larger vases, which were very artistically designed and uh, glazed very fancily. I just can't imagine the kiln that it took to cook and bake that uh, seven foot one. Yeah. Well, that's uh, the, this is that's Mark Herman. Um, you had the uh, the uh, picture of the West Baden Springs Hotel. Yes. Uh, we went there for our 25th wedding anniversary about five years ago and it has been restored magnificently. Yes. Uh, so if anyone wants to take a quick trip from St. Louis, uh, it's, it's an excellent place to, to go and, and spend a few days. And there's actually two hotels that are real close to each other, West Baden Springs and French Lick. And don't think French Lick doesn't get a lot of teasing. <laughs> really? Uh, Why? <laughs> <laughs> One other thing I wanted to uh, let you know about, uh, Sally, you had talked about the Forest Map or Ferris Map, P-H-A-R-U-S, yeah. which yeah. is online at the uh, Library of Congress. Uh, I did some research on them uh, when we did a reproduction of that map for the society about 10 or 15 years ago. They were a company that did some similar maps of big cities in Europe from London and Paris and I think Berlin. Uh, and they did the 1904 World's Fair with those little artistic buildings, but that was probably done in late 02 or early 03. 
uh, before a lot of the buildings got finalized or even built, uh, as a lot of construction took place in 03 and early 04 even. And it doesn't go into the details of the smaller buildings. Uh, that map that you were looking at that showed essentially a uh, uh, kind of a geographic map layout that showed the smaller buildings, I think is much more accurate than that forest map. And uh, here's a challenge for you, Sally. See if you can spot the Indiana building on the uh, aerial view, the Norbury Wayman print that was just mailed out to most of y'all. Oh, uh, I will. I will try to remember to look. It's still curled up in the. I've had it out of the tube, but it's curled back up in the tube, so it's safe from critters. Yeah. Well, if you want to keep it safe, the best thing is uh, get yourself one of those uh, Michael's frames for about fifteen bucks with the coupon. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt, but can you all see the vase? Ooh. Oh, wow. yes, yes. It came Don't drop a, it. Don't drop it. <laughs> yes, it came from a very prominent family in St. Louis, and and we have the provenance on it. So, gee, we're very, we're very proud of it, and, and we we want to thank Sally so much for for we didn't realize the the rest of the story. So, to well, speak. cool. But thank you I'm, very much. And we're this is Bob's prized possession now. I should think nah, so. Don't, look, don't let it slide off that chair. <laughs> <laughs> really? He's holding, he's holding tight. All right. That's beautiful, Bobby. I like that. I, I, I saw somebody's question go by about William Henry Harrison. I, I have not come across any kind of a reference to a display or recognition of him. Can you hold, can you hold it up there? At the well, fair. Shows, shows. Uh, Joe Girard, I would guess, uh, typed in something directly to me that since Baden is basically German for bath or baths, I'm wondering if it was originally settled by Germans. Um, very possibly. The, the, the state in general is very heavily German populated. Um, and, and by heavily, I mean like somewhere around 15 to 20 percent. Lafayette is very heavily German populated. I'm, I'm only, only the Carter part of me is not German. So we are we are heavily German populated, but not by a, like a fifty percent majority or something like that. It's like fifteen twenty percent. Okay, and the same individual wondered. Uh, uh, I won't say did this, but uh, uh, I may have missed it because I was looking for uh, these uh, memorabilia. How did you get by without mentioning Larry Bird? <laughs> I don't follow sports. <laughs> it, it was a, it's a, it's it was a tr it, it it was a trial for me to just do Ray E Ray. E -ray. Yes. So that's yes. why. Um, well, uh, any any more questions for the group and uh, you know from the group for Sally? Uh, she'll stay online, I'm sure, a little bit. Uh, I've got.